welcome back good morning and uh, we will start the next lecture of energy conservation and waste heat recovery where we will continue our discussion again on energy storage and this time we will go to a new means of energy storage which is electrochemical energy storage okay electrochemical energy storage what do we mean by that so in the first class when we talk or first class on energy storage when we started talking about it we mentioned that the first thing that comes to our mind when we talk about storing energy and using it elsewhere whenever required the first thing that comes to our mind is battery right we use batteries we use to charge a battery by using electricity we do it in our cell phones every day okay we charge our cell phone and then use it right we could have used our cell phone directly by always plugging in into the wall outlet but we don't do that that is what gives makes it mobile laptops another example we are able to take our work anywhere i can meet you somewhere on the street just go to a coffee shop open my laptop and discuss and have a nice official meeting over a cup of coffee why because i have a battery in the laptop which in which powers the machine and enables me to do work while i am on the move right so that's electrochemical energy storage so finally <laughs> we come to batteries as an energy storage medium okay so batteries uh, as we know it's a stack of individual cells okay so when we talk about battery we go to a sh shop and say let's buy a battery we typically buy one cell some applications just one cell is good enough but in most applications it's not i mean even in our tv remotes most of the times we need two such batteries many other appliances in a torch probably we need three of them if it's a powerful one okay so a battery consists of a stack of individual cells okay the cell comprises of anode and cathode in an electrolyte so we know that in a battery we have two electrodes one is an anode one is a cathode and then there's an electrolyte the electrolyte can be liquid can be uh, solid can be powder and so on so we will look at that so what happens is again you have a charging and discharging cycle in the discharging cycle what we do is we actually remove the heat or sorry remove the energy not heat in the board okay so we remove the energy and this is when we are actually using the gadget which which is powered by the battery right and during the charging cycle what happens is we uh, actually recharge those batteries so that we can where the energy is again stored okay many a times in the regular batteries that we have they are not rechargeable i mean they are just one time use they come you to you as charged over a certain period of time they will discharge uh, depending on the load and then we have to throw them away right well i i i should use the word carefully the throw them away no we have to dispose them correctly because these are hazardous materials sorry this is not a course on environmental engineering but still uh, please please keep in mind that batteries whenever you are done and you want to dispose them off do it properly do it through the proper recycling channels okay a little little deviation from the topic but still a good message to um, remind ourselves right so various cell chemistries are used lead acid is something that we use it for example most of the cars use lead acid, lead acid battery nickel cadmium silver zinc nickel metal hydride sodium halide so different kinds of batteries are there sodium halide for example when i was working for ge ge had a battery business uh, which was making sodium halide batteries all right so what we will do next is uh, we will look into the functioning of the lead acid battery okay so what is a lead acid battery it has two electrodes one is lead it's actually not solid lead it's what we call spongy lead which is a negative electrode and lead peroxide which is a positive electrode okay the electrolyte is dilute sulfuric acid so what happens is during the discharging cycle the lead and lead peroxide react with the sulfuric acid okay there when when we have actually a polarity or 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 a load attached to to the batteries then what happens is and essentially what happens therefore is the dilute sulfuric acid becomes even more diluted because it loses the sulfate uh, ions which goes to the lead and what we have is lead sulfate deposition on both the electrodes okay 
during the discharging cycle what happens is uh, or sorry during the charging cycle what happens is this lead sulf during the charging cycle is when we actually attach a polarity across then what happens is the lead sulphate the sulphate ions are released and then they again recombine with the water and uh, what we finish what we finally get is again lead and lead oxide and dilute sulfuric acid. So, after a charging cycle this is what we again get back and discharging of course, uh, we have let us we have a further reduction in concentration of the electrolyte in this case sulfuric acid and uh, we have sulphate lead sulphate formation on both the electrodes. So, what I will do is I will play you a small video the link is over here and that will kind of show the sequence in which the, the reactions take place. I think this is explained in a very nice animated way uh, much better than what I can do using the paper etcetera that I have. Okay. So, I will just run this video. Let us have a discussion on working principle of lead acid battery. This is very commonly used as storage battery or secondary battery. Before going through the working principle, we should know about materials used for lead acid storage battery cells. The main active materials required to construct a lead acid battery are lead peroxide, sponge lead and dilute sulfuric acid. The positive plate of lead acid battery is made of lead peroxide. This is dark brown, hard and brittle substance. The negative plate of lead acid battery is made of pure lead in soft sponge condition. Dilute sulfuric acid used for lead acid battery has ratio of water is to acid equal to 3 is to 1. The lead acid storage battery is formed by dipping lead peroxide plate and sponge lead plate in dilute sulfuric acid. A load is connected externally between these plates. In diluted sulfuric acid, the molecules of acid split into positive hydrogen ions and negative sulfate ions. The hydrogen ions when reach at lead peroxide plate, they receive electrons from it and become hydrogen atom which again attack lead peroxide and form lead oxide and water. This lead oxide reacts with sulfuric acid and forms lead sulfate and water. Negative sulfate ions are moving freely in the solution. So, some of them will reach to pure lead plate where they give their extra electrons and become radical sulfate. As the radical sulfate cannot exist alone, it will attack pure lead and will form lead sulfate. As positive hydrogen ions take electrons from lead peroxide plate and negative sulfate ions give electrons to lead plate, there would be an inequality of electrons between these two plates. Hence, there would be a flow of current through the external load between these plates for balancing this inequality of electrons. This process is called discharging of lead acid battery. Now, we will disconnect the load and connect lead sulphate covered lead peroxide plate with positive terminal of an external DC source and lead peroxide covered lead plate with negative terminal of that DC source. During discharging, the density of sulphuric acid falls, but there still sulphuric acid exists in the solution. This sulfuric acid also remains as positive hydrogen ions and negative sulphate ions in the solution. Hydrogen ions being positively charged move to the electrode connected with the negative terminal of the DC source. Here each hydrogen ion takes one electron from that and becomes hydrogen atom. These hydrogen atoms then attack lead sulphate and form lead and sulfuric acid. Negative sulphate ions move towards the electrode connected with the positive terminal of DC source where they will give up their extra electrons and become radical sulphate. This radical sulphate reacts with lead sulphate of anode and forms lead peroxide and sulphuric acid. Hence by charging, the lead acid storage battery cell becomes ready for discharging. 
All right, so I think that video very nicely explained the reactions that happen inside a lead acid battery both during the charging cycle, both first during the discharging cycle and next during the charging cycle. All right, so what we will do now is look at some of the features. So, this as I said is used most commonly what we see is used in a car and a car battery if you if you look at it even from outside you will see there are 6 different cells. So, there are 12 electrodes right. There is a flexibility in current and it is high reversibility. So, the car batteries I mean they typically these batteries last 4 or 5 years actually in car whatever I have driven. Um, I think in each of the car I have driven so far which is only 2 um, and each of them I have driven for like five, 5 to 7 years I have had to change battery only once and that too in one of the cars where the battery I think they installed an old battery to start with. But typically uh, the batteries run pretty reliably for 4 to 5 years unless actually you have you have done something wrong <laughs> for example leave the lights on through the night and then it will get discharged uh, all that. So, so, the batteries that way is high reversibility, there is a flexibility in current because depending on the what you are it, I mean how much current that you want to draw and therefore, how fast it is going to be discharged there is some flexibility that is available ok all right. And the cell just the problem is if, if you leave the battery in itself or if you do not use it for a long time uh, leave it even in a charge condition there is a self discharge that happens and that is true for any battery actually. And the other thing that can happen is because of this repeated coating of the electrodes with sulphate this is called sulphation. So, sulphation with time happens where the electrodes are not completely cleaned uh, and again that is contamination that happens um, with time ok. So, these are some of the features, but as I said they are pretty reliable, but the thing is these batteries are heavy all right. So, energy to mass ratio if you look at it, uh, it is not as high as compared to some of the other batteries which are much lighter. So, other forms of battery nickel cadmium, silver, zinc I have written the electrode materials and the electrolyte and as you can see that uh, here they are different of course, silver, zinc will be more expensive. Nickel cadmium um, is used typically in our portable electronic materials and these batteries have high energy to mass ratio by typically because the mass is lower it's, it is a lighter than, uh, than the batteries that we use in cars the lead acid batteries and greater life cycle greater cycle life sorry. So, number of cycles that these batteries go through is much more compared to a lead acid battery ok. So, actually there used to be a time when uh, the lead acid batteries I remember from my father and my uncles uh, people who had cars among the ones who had cars they would bring the they would bring the battery home and they would once the battery is discharged and they would charge it it would take a long time and then they will put it back in the car. Uh, these days that does not happen that much uh, probably because of you know reduction in cost etcetera for consumerism. Um, we see most of the batteries typically of course, they go through charging and discharging cycles in the car, but I really do not see when the battery has been completely drained. Um, the modern batteries are brought home or taken to a charging station where they are charged again recharged again um, and then brought back into the car. So, that does not happen. All right. Okay. Next, what we are going to look at is chemical energy storage. So, previous one was electrochemical. You had a certain electrolyte and and anode and cathode immersed in it, and we were using electrical energy also because there was movement of ions, etc. This is completely chemical energy storage, and in some way you can even argue that this is thermal energy storage because the the form in which the energy is stored or released is again heat. So, the overall principle on which this operates is there are certain reactions chemical reactions which are reversible and which involve a heat of reaction. What is heat of reaction? So, what it means is heat of reaction is when a certain chemical reaction is exothermic it generates heat and then when the certain chemical reactions are endothermic where you have to actually supply thermal energy and which is absorbed when the reactants turn to products right. Now, imagine such a reaction 
which is reversible then what happens then when the reaction takes place in one direction from reactants to products you have an exothermic reaction and when the reversible happens uh, and, and the or the reaction happens in the opposite direction the products now turn back to reactants you it, you actually absorb heat and it is an endothermic reaction right so one such example as is shown there is the methanation and reformation reaction okay the methanation is when methane is formed from carbon monoxide and hydrogen right and this is the reaction that happens and this is an exothermic reaction so when methane happens there is heat that is given out okay. and that heat of reaction as i have shown is q is 250.3 kilojoules per gram mole right on the other hand when methane and water reacts and form carbon monoxide and hydrogen which is what is happening here in this schematic then it's an endothermic reaction we have to supply heat clear and that is what is happening over here i am supplying heat and then this heat is kind of stored in these products so the overall principle over here is let us say i want to generate uh, let us say let's again think of a power plant where during off peak hours i have additional um, adi additional generation of electricity okay or i can have additional generation of electricity based on the energy that i have at my disposal so what i will do therefore is instead of using that com energy let's let's again talk about a steam turbine power plant instead of a fossil fuel power, uh, and which is powered by fossil fuel or or well, let's say nuclear reaction whatever it is okay or natural gas coal natural gas whatever it is what i would do is i would use this source of thermal energy partially during off peak hours partially to generate the steam and the rest of it to have a reformation reaction where i will have methane and water as reactants and i would supply the additional thermal energy additional heat and get carbon monoxide and hydrogen all right and during off peak hours what i will do is therefore i will have these two react and have a methanation reaction so that they react with each other and and the products are methane and water and during that reaction i get some additional thermal energy out of the reaction which can be used for generating additional steam and therefore electricity clear so again this is the overall principle that we are using all right this is chemical energy storage that's what we call we are calling it but you can also uh, think about it as or you can also argue that well this is also a form of thermal energy storage because the energy is stored in the form of thermal energy uh, but then the reason by why why this thermal energy or the heat is absorbed and released is because of a chemical reaction and a reversible chemical reaction uh, and the example that we have taken is methanation reformation clear all right the next one that we are going to talk about is thermochemical storage okay so again you can argue uh, why is the previous one not thermochemical and this we are calling th thermochemical well it's it's all about nomenclature okay so here again it's a reversible reaction there's a product ab and a reactant a plus b okay or or the other way because it's a reversible reaction so a plus b converts to ab or ab dissociates into a plus b the way this happens is the trigger as to which direction this reaction will happen whether ab will convert to a plus b or a plus b will convert to ab is dictated by the temperature and that temperature quite appropriately is known as the turning temperature because the direction of the reaction turns depending on whether we are above that turning temperature or below the turning temperature all right so temperature above the turning temperature the reaction will shift from left to right and temperature below turning temperature the reaction will shift to from right to left 
Okay, it's either way. I mean, this above and below uh, can can be different. I mean, if I just put a plus b and a b on the other sides, this above and below will change. So that doesn't matter. What I'm trying to say is the reaction happens in a certain direction above a temperature and in the opposite direction below that temperature. Okay. So, I am showing some examples over here in this table uh, where the heat of reaction is shown and of course, this is okay, and, and very important point like in chemical energy storage these have to be exothermic or endothermic exothermic and endothermic reactions exothermic endothermic reversible reactions only then is that energy going to be stored in the form of heat in one case and released in the form of heat in the other case clear. So, let us take one example over here ammonia and hydrogen fluoride both of these are in gaseous state and they will react to form this component okay maybe ammonium fluoride i don't know what it is called and it is solid the turning temperature is close to 500 kelvin and the heat of reaction is 149.3 kilojoules per gram mole i'm sorry i should have written that per gram mole clear Similarly, here magnesium hydroxide is magnesium oxide and water and again we have these temperatures and heat of reactions written. There are a couple of reactions where I did not have the data, so I have left that blank. But I hope I am able to tell you the message or convey you the principle of using this type of energy storage um, system. Okay. Now, out of these reactions, which are the ones that are more favorable? So, typically they say is the reactions that are producing two distinct phases like a solid and gas are considered to be favorable or suitable because then these two can be easily separated out. For example, ammonia and hydrogen fluoride both being in gaseous state, it is very difficult to for them to be separated. But think about this one, the third one which is magnesium oxide and carbon dioxide. One is solid, one is gas. So, let us say when this reaction has happened, I can easily separate out these reactants and keep them separately. All right. And then later when I need them to react and, and give me the endothermic or exothermic reaction, I will again bring them together okay, and, and ensure that the temperature is above or below the turning temperature. Clear? So, that is important. Let us say in the first case, if we had both gaseous products, then it would be very difficult if we have to use, uh, I mean of course, separation is possible, gas to gas separation is not, it is not like it is impossible, but we have to use uh, more sophisticated methods or more complicated methods. Okay. So, for example, this one ammonia, water vapor and SO3. Right it will be very difficult to separate out these three phases and compare that to calcium oxide and water vapor. I can I can easily separate one is a gas just by just by gravity itself just by due to density difference I can separate out these two clear. All right. So, that kind of uh, wraps up these were the last two especially I did not want to go to too much of details these are just just wanted to give you the feel. So, what did we study today uh, or in this lecture are three different uh, types of energy storage. The first one was electrochemical energy storage and where we spent a little more time and we talked about batteries. Right? The second one was chemical energy storage. And here what we said is these are reversible chemical reactions endothermic in one direction, exothermic in another direction. And the example that we took was methanation and reformation. Okay. And the last one that we talked about was thermo chemical
energy storage all right so this one again we were talking about reversible reactions and here we said that there is an there is a there exists a certain temperature the concept of turning temperature t star based on which the direction of reaction reverses all right so these are the three types of energy storage systems that we discussed in this lecture all related to chemical energy um, the first is electrochemical next one is chemical energy purely through chemical reactions but again thermal is involved because energy storage is in the form of thermal energy and thermochemical energy storage is i would say it's very similar to that of chemical energy storage except that the reversal of the reactions happen based on depending on the temperature uh, that the reactants are subjected to all right so that kind of wraps up uh, this section on energy storage where we learnt about three new techniques for um, energy storage i won't say battery is new because we all know about it but i thought it, uh, i hope it was a good recap um, of how a lead acid battery functions um, and and to and for us to know that apart from lead acid what are the other types of batteries that are being used today all right so thank you very much i hope you learned something new uh, and uh, we will meet in the next lecture again where we will take up some new topic thank you very much have a great day